Morning, everybody. So good to see all of you this morning. It was a crazy week. We, last week, we had a bunch of people missing because of the terrible weather. I don't blame you at all. I barely came there myself, but <laughs> it was wonderful to be able to see everybody that was here last week, but it's great to have all of you back, and hopefully, prayerfully, we have those who were sick and who have gone through surgeries and other things back with us. I miss so many wonderful people this morning that I would love to see here today, and I know they can't be here today. Let's keep them in our hearts and our prayers. Uh, you know, Eric had surgery. I, I, Miss Ruth is still recovering. Uh, there's so many. Uh, Reba got to see at, at a funeral, so it was good to see her. And so we just want to continue to pray for those who were ailing among us and, and you can't be here. It's such a wonderful thing to be in the Lord's house with all of you. I'm so grateful for all of you, for our new brother in Christ, for, for a wonderful time that the youth had this past week. Uh, let's, let's be thankful for all the good things, but also be prayer for all the things that we're still going through today. It will come for everyone. <clears throat> it doesn't care if you're rich or poor, old or young, successful or a failure, well-known or obscure. Death comes for everyone. I hate it. I hate death. I hate that there's separation and loss. I hate seeing people suffer because they don't have their loved ones with them anymore. And it's a generational thing. We're always seeing those we love pass into this next world in heaven. And, and we, we, we mourn and we rejoice at the same time. But death is an awful thing. It, it's a separator. It's something that Jesus came to the earth to deal with, to, to remove. And because he came and because he lived today, we know that sin and death are no more, that they're no longer an issue for those who walk in the Spirit in Jesus Christ. We're thankful for that, but that doesn't mean that death goes away. It's always right there in front of us. If you were raised with Christ, that means that you have a story to tell of death and a story of rebirth. We don't have to taste death to know death. It's a, it's a continuous part of the Christian life. And it might sound morbid to some people. In fact, the Romans used to think that Christians were the craziest people in the world. They thought they were cannibals because they talked about eating of the flesh and drinking of blood, and they didn't understand what they were saying when they said that Jesus is alive, but we celebrate his death. But it's something that we do in our own lives. We celebrate our death, don't we? Isn't that what we do every first day of the week? Not only do we celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus, we celebrate our own spiritual death for those of us who've been immersed in Christ. And it's a good thing because I don't want to live in sin and death. I don't want death to be the final note in my life. I want it to be a beginning point, not an ending point. So there is no other narrative that describes us better than those who have gone from death to life. As we continue our series about trading up, when we follow Christ... And our baptism in his name, we are trading up from death to life. There is new life in Jesus Christ. There's life after spiritual death. And that change that we go through is ongoing. It's a part of our continuous narrative and story and calling. But what is it that makes this story so compelling that all men should want to claim it as their own? How do we trade up from death to life? Are we doing that in our lives today? In Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, I've got a lot of reading to do today. Is that okay with you? Can you bear with me? Good, good, good. Reading is fun. Reading is good. He starts off by saying this, And you he made alive who were dead trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience 
among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, and I love this turn, this change. That's why Ephesians is my favorite New Testament book. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us all together sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace to us and his kindness in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It is a beautiful testimony of our journey from death to life that Paul offers us here in Ephesians chapter 2. And I can never get over, as long as I've read this verse, the beauty when he says, and you who were dead, he made alive. It's still something I don't quite get. I don't understand it fully, but I'm so glad that it happened to me. As we look at what it means to trade up from death to life, at the change that's happening in our lives today, I want to correct so many false assumptions about our new life in Christ that so many have had over the years. As we look at what it means to trade up from death to life, realize that we are trading empty desires for true fulfillment. He talks about this in the early part of Ephesians chapter 2. He said, you once walked according to the course of this world to the prince of the power of the earth. In other words, you were Satan's slave and you did what he wanted. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. By nature, children of wrath. He said all we knew was the flesh. And it doesn't matter how good morally a person was before they knew Christ. They were still under the rule of Satan. And so many people in the world still are today. They are still under the bondage of Satan and living in death. And they don't know it. But we who are in Christ... We have something better than what the flesh has to offer, than what something physical can do in our lives. We were made for something better than the flesh. Our hearts are vessels capable of holding the love of Christ, the hope of salvation, and the promise of eternity. I used to hear so many times, especially as a kid, you know, kids, sin is fun but it's not good. Have y'all heard that before? It's really fun to sin, but it's not good fun. And and people always acted like you were giving something up when you became a Christian. Like you were sacrificing something great to be a child of God. And, And I think part of that is our misunderstanding of so many things. Because growing up, I got this, that This is what you don't do. And if you don't do everything you shouldn't do, you're going to be happy. That doesn't work for me. I want to know what is it about Christianity that makes it worth everything. And the answer is that what Jesus gives us is by far, without any doubt, superior to what sin offers. And it always will be the joy of living in Christ. Dying to sin, there's nothing like it. But because sin is sin, it fools us into thinking it's better. It denies us the privilege of being children of light in the midst of darkness. To live for our base desires is not fun, nor is thinking and acting according to the flesh How many times in the past have we seen churches built on the flesh run like a business, run like a board of trustees, and churches that that think, well, well, how do we get, you know, 
more members and how do we become more attractive to people in the world and how do we do this and how do we do that and i understand that we have to keep up with the times and we have to to think about how to reach out to people but sometimes people have turned the church and and god's body the the living body of christ into some sort of fleshly sort of conflagration of what is spiritual and what is worldly and it doesn't work it never works Unless we are spiritual, godly people, we cannot be God's people. We have to put to death the deeds of the flesh. You cannot win people in the spirit by offering them in the flesh. We cannot be the world in order to reach the world. That doesn't mean that we spurn modernity, but it does mean that we spurn the sinful flesh that got us into the predicament we were in before we became Christians. So many people buy into this idea that you're missing out if you're a Christian, that you're losing this valuable thing that people have, and they just don't understand because they haven't tasted the spiritual things that give us hope, that give us something fresh and new and exciting that fills us like nothing else can fill us. I love the song, Nobody Fills My Heart, like Jesus. Have you heard that before? It's a beautiful thought. Nobody can do that the way Jesus does it. We're told in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 19, Paul's big on lists. He's got lots of lists. They're good lists, but they're a little bit repetitive. He, he mentions something similar in Colossians. He mentioned something similar in Romans, but he says this. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit. And this is what I love because he shows us the perfect contrast is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. People who choose Jesus want something better than what the world offers but you can't live in both worlds you have to live for christ you have to die to this world james says it this way whoever makes himself a friend to the world is an enemy of god sometimes i think we want the world to like us a little too much so we want to be less aggressive about teaching the truth or preaching the gospel folks i'm t here to tell you Unless we are all in for Christ, we're lost. We're lost. We don't know our way. Unless Christ is at the center of our fulfillment. Unless, as Jesus said, man shall not live bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Is that just hyperbole or do we believe that? Is it our motto? Is it, is it who we are deep within us that we crave the knowledge of Christ, that we crave the fellowship of our brothers and sisters, that we crave prayer, that we crave goodness, that we pr crave putting to death the things of this world and finding true life in serving others. We must keep the difference between a life of fulfillment and a life of death at the forefront of our minds in all things, lest we be fooled into thinking that we're somehow better off living in the flesh. How big a leak does it take in your plumbing to cause a problem? It can be a tiny one, doesn't it? Just a little leak. Suddenly there's, there's water everywhere and you go, what's going on? So the guys go in and they, they plug up a leak and sometimes another leak appears like magic. And, and it just takes a small amount of compromise in our lives to turn us away from the truth. That's why we have to be vigilant. That's why baptism can only be day one. It can't be the last thing we do in Christ. We have to continue to die to sin, to die to self. That's why Romans 6 says, 
that the old man was crucified with him, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For we died. Our life is hidden. That's where it belongs now. Now, as we clear away the debris of sin and death, we can see a bit clearer to know that we're trading up when we go from death to sin to life in Christ. We trade up from death to life all the more when we realize what we're gaining when sin is no longer dominating our thinking. We trade empty promises for a life filled with deliverance. Jesus delivered us from the body of sin and death. He, he delivered us from, from a meaningless existence to something beautiful and wonderful. Because all that the world offers is empty. It's empty things. It's things that don't help us. Things that, that don't bring us up. It's things that don't give us life. Back in our passage of Scripture, he says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Verse 4, Ephesians 2. Even when we were dead in trespasses. In other words, when we were at our lowest, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He's reminding us this wasn't our doing. This wasn't because I suddenly decided that I'm going to be better, so I'm going to lift myself up by my own bootstraps. That's not the picture that he gives here. He gives us a picture of absolute hopelessness, and then God comes in, and we say, God, I need you. I want you. I want to follow you. And he lifts us up, and he draws us into life, and he fills us with his spirit, and he fills us with his love, and it has nothing to do with my righteousness or my goodness or how good I am compared to that other person in town. It only has to do with my depravity and my willingness to change. And the thing is, sin always offers far less than it, what it takes from you. While a life raised with Christ offers you infinitely more than what is required. People think it's too high a price to be a Christian, but I say it's too high a price not to be. You're not getting anything for your return when you sin. Look at the world around you. Look at, look at the devastation of families, marriages, of countries, of, of children sold into slavery, of people abused here in the United States on a daily basis by their spouse, by their parents. Look at all of the misery of sin. Do you think any of that offers promise? It's all empty. It's a shell People who get into drugs, people who lie, people who are envious, people who are bitter. Do you know how much bitterness has hurt the church over the years? We need to be more forgiving people. We need to be more loving people, kinder people, more gentle, more understanding, more patient. We, we are sometimes saddled with these things because we think it's right, because we think it's okay, but in the end it only leaves us worse off than when we started. That's the way sin does. It starts out seeming like the right thing, but in the end it makes things far worse. It's like bad debt, right? You get into debt to get out of debt, but you're still in debt, and now you're worse in debt. And the more it piles up, there's a point where you go, I can't do this anymore. I need to get out. And folks, we need to get to that point in our lives when we realize I cannot let sin continue to keep me from living for Jesus Christ fully. And I'm not condemning you. I'm not saying all people, you just need to stop sinning because I'm weak you i struggle so much and i know that my life could be a thousand percent better if i could give my full attention to serving the lord but sin because it's sin when it takes the opportunity it slowly pulls us back in it hurts us so much i've been hurt by people i hurt by sin on so many occasions in the church I've seen churches do bitter and terrible things to each other. And, and I weep and I mourn for the Lord's people because we let sin in the door. It's always going to be there. You'll never get rid of it completely until the Lord comes. 
but we can do something about being delivered from it. At least me. I can do something about my life and say, Lord, deliver me from sin. Deliver me from the evil one. You notice Jesus' prayer, deliver us from the evil one. He didn't say, may I deliver myself from the evil one. That's not possible. We need deliverance. And he always delivers. That's the great thing about God. Man will fail you. If you trust in man, if you put your faith and your religion and your beliefs in a man or a woman, you will falter and fail because people will let you down. Even the best people in the world have a bad day. But Christ Jesus has never, not once, let me down. He is my Lord. He is my sweet Savior. He has never ever reneged on a promise he always delivers he is mighty to save right every day we think at times that sin might deliver just this once that's why we do it that's why we continue to sin However, we often think this way when our hearts and minds stop thinking of things pertaining to God. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 tells us this. And it's such a beautiful passage of Scripture because it it gives us this, this idea that there's something better and higher for us to be thinking of. He says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. You get this powerful image of Christ standing there or sitting at the right hand of God, and he says, I want you to think of that that idea, that thought as you live your life. And then he says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. He says, I know that there's some bad things going on. I know that the world wants to pull you in and says, this is important. This is important. This is important. He says, but your life is hidden. It belongs to Christ. It's his. And everything that's good is found above. Because the things of the earth can be destroyed. They can be manipulated. They can be taken from us. But the things of Jesus Christ are secure. Aren't you glad no one can take away your salvation? Aren't you glad that no one can take away the forgiveness of sin from you? And if you allow them to, if you allow people to take away your hope in Jesus, that's on you. But God will deliver when you call on him. God is mighty to save. When we decide how our story will be written, we should remember that God always delivers to those who trust in him while sin will always leave us with broken promises. We don't have to wait until the end to figure this out. Wendy's had one of the most brilliant marketing strategies ever. Now, Wendy's is great. Their their Twitter feed is golden. If you ever read it, they they just, they destroy everybody. They, They destroy McDonald's, they destroy Burger King, everybody. But in 1984, they came up with the most, one of the most brilliant marketing strategies of all when an old lady looked at this place that that was called uh what was it called it had a funny name oh home of the big bun that was the name of the the fake restaurant they went to and they were looking at this big fluffy bun and she opened it up and there was a comically small patty with a piece of cheese and a pickle and she said where's the beef remember that it's okay if you don't i'm an old man just look at me like I'm old. My son tells me that all the time. You're an old man, old man. I'm like, okay, whatever. I said the same thing to my dad. It's going to happen for generations, right? I, I think we have to ask, well, where's the proof that the world will give you what it offers? Where, where's the beef, right? There's nothing that the world can give that's ever comparable to the joy of a Christian life to the hope of eternity, to the peace that surpasses understanding. These aren't just words. This is real life. This is truth. This is what what the world misses every time 
This is what Western general, uh, civilization was built on at one point, was, was the things that God provides, the truth that God provides that so many people have lost sight of. And so we take with us this idea that life in Christ offers assurance and fulfillment instead of empty desires and empty promises. And we look at the center question of life. What is it all for? Why do we do this? Why are we alive today? When we trade up and go from death to life, we're trading a life without meaning for a life full of purpose. And he says it in the last part of this passage of Scripture here in Ephesians chapter 2. He says this, For by grace you are saved, verse 8, uh, through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For, and he gives us a very clear picture here, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them we were made for better things than the mundane purpose found in living for ourselves we were created in Christ for good works prepared for each of us to live in such a way that we find real purpose for being in this world. Sin and death can never promise that. You know, it's weird. We live in a small house, but it's perfect size for us right now because we have the younger two living with us and the older two living a, just basically a block away, maybe two blocks. But for the first time in my married life, I have not had a junk drawer, and it's weird. Because whenever we have a piece of junk that we need to get rid of, I don't know where to put it. It's always gone in the junk drawer. That's what junk drawers are for. I think every house made a junk drawer. I don't know. Maybe they missed out on the junk drawer idea uh, in this house. And, of course, you know what it's full of, right? Junk. We call it a junk drawer, but we don't get rid of things in it because we might need it someday. We, we need to call it that we might need it someday drawer, but we don't. We call it the junk drawer because we know deep in our hearts that it's junk. How many times are we spinning our wheels because we're not living our purpose? This is a daily calling, right? This isn't one of those callings you say, you know, Someday I'm going to do everything for the church. Someday It's kind of like someday I'm going to lose weight and feel better about myself and all these other things. All these some days that we do, right? Someday I'm going to write that book. Someday I'm going to, to aspire to be a writer or aspire to be an artist or, or whatever we say to ourselves. We say someday I'm going to get my life together. I'm going to be a Christian. Today is the day, folks. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the time to live for better things. You have a purpose today. You don't have to wait for somebody to give you instructions. The elder's job is not to give us a list of people to visit, even though that's helpful. The, the, the congregation is not here to give you all the checkpoints of the things that are right to do. You know the right thing to do. You know the good things you can do. You say it's too hard. It's too difficult. Folks, it's right there in front of you. Give heart to Christ. He'll get you there. Because we need purpose. The church needs purpose. Meeting together is not a purpose. Folks, I know we're supposed to worship him, but that's not a purpose in and of itself. Our worship starts when our hands get dirty. If you want to prove that you love Jesus, serve him. Jesus said this, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve. Does that describe our church? I'll tell you, it does. I mean, I'm not just making you look good. This church is a group of servants. I've seen it. This is a loving church. You love each other. I've, I've seen it with my eyes. I've seen it firsthand. But we have to ask ourselves every day, what is Christ calling us to do for him? What 
works can we do that glorify him? Because it's not just about doing good things and being the good doer person or whatever, you know, the person that does all the right things. It's, it's about finding the purpose for which we were born into this world again through Jesus Christ, that we were remade into his workmanship, meant to do good. Why? Because it's so wonderful to do good works in the name of Jesus as gratitude for all that he's done for us, joy so that we can bring this joy to others. There is no better thing to do than to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing more fulfilling than a life full of serving others. There is nothing like it. It's amazing. And you'll find that we'll stop complaining and griping and fussing and being so over-the-top worldly and sinful when we're actually doing what God called us to do. We're still going to have problems. All of our problems won't fade away. But let me tell you that when you find your purpose, it sticks It gives you a meaning and a joy like no other. And I say to myself, I need more purpose. I need more good works. I need more faithfulness. I need more getting my hands dirty because I know that it's the thing that I need. And sometimes you know the thing that you need and you're just not doing it, right? Let's start doing it. We're not going to do it perfectly, but let's, let's start doing the work because God works through people who are willing to let him be in control, to let him call the shots. I love what Hebrews 6, 9 through 12 says. To, to a people that he was calling spiritual babies, you've come to need milk and not solid food. He's almost insulting them. He says, don't be like the, the, the earth that brings forth fruit, but then it sort of dries up and, it, and the end of it is to be burned. But then he says this, because he's not condemning the people he's writing to. He says in verse 9, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation that we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. He says, don't get discouraged. Don't get sluggish. Don't get bogged down by this world and by the promises of this world and the people of this world go and serve Jesus Christ and love the Lord love your neighbor and love those who are lost and show compassion and, and kindness to others and if you do so you'll never lose that purpose the path to life is clear but we can only take this path and leave the other one behind in that moment each day when we choose to live for that which brings death or that which brings life Let us choose to live for that purpose by which we are all called. I can't count the number of times before GPS that I ended up driving in a circle over and over again before I found my way to any destination. Sometimes even in my own neighborhood, I was a terrible person when it came to directions. I still am. Driving in circles is pointless. Don't you hate it when you've been driving around and you know that it was all for nothing. Let's not live our lives that way. Let's choose to live for something greater than this world's offerings. Let's live for something that brings joy and life to the community around us, to the people around us. Let's live for Christ. In Christ alone, we find the things that fulfill us and tell us We're doing what we should be doing. Let's be a church full of purpose, full of vision, full of joy, and full of Christ. Let us go from death to life every day. If you need to go from death to life by being baptized into Christ, I can think of no other better opportunity for you than to come forward as you give your life to him, as you, you die to yourself and are raised in Christ so that you can live live with him and if you've let a leak form in your life
to where the world is seeping in and you're losing that passion or you're bitter and you need to come back home. Whatever it is, Christ will receive you with open arms and with love and this congregation will help and support you. Whatever need you have, please come forward. Together we stand and sing. Soon.